folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all. My name is Bridget Walm. I'm the President and CEO of the Pritchard Committee for Academic Excellence. Members of the press, legislators, and partners, thank you for joining us for today's release of a fragile ecosystem for Will Kentucky Child Care Survive When the Dollars Run Out? This report is the fourth in a series studying the state of child care in Kentucky. It asked a critical question as Kentucky speeds toward a funding cliff for child care as the federal American Rescue Plan dollars are exhausted. The report was made possible through the collaboration of many partners, including Kentucky Youth Advocates, Metro United Way, United Way of Greater Cincinnati, United Way of Kentucky, the Child Care Council of Kentucky, EC Learn, Learning Grow, Child Care Advocates of Kentucky, 4C, Appalachia Early Childhood Network, and the 500 child care providers from 94 counties across Kentucky who responded to the survey. Thank you. Simply put, a strong Kentucky workforce and economy depend on child care access and quality for working families. Today, over 45,000 Kentuckians struggle to attach to the workforce or education to move themselves forward due to a lack of child care and early education access and affordability. Kentucky's families and businesses cannot afford to lose more child care. Without a plan to keep the child care sector strong, providers find themselves facing impossible choices. The early learning sector invested relief dollars well to slow the ill effects of the pandemic on child care. The coming end of ARPA dollars, however, means the time is now to ensure immediate and long-term sustainability and growth. With the release of this report, we call for state leaders to ensure the continuation of strategic improvements and investment in the child care sector. Here to share more about the importance of early care and education to Kentucky's economy, we welcome State Senator Danny Carroll and State Representative Samara Hebron. Thank you both. Thank you. I'm State Representative Samara Hebron and I represent the 18th District, which includes all of Grayson County and part of Hardin County. As an advocate for better child care, uh, and a primary co-sponsor, or a primary sponsor of House Bill 499. I'm honored to be here with you all today. Child care is the workforce behind the workforce. Without access to affordable and quality child care, more Kentuckians will be kept out of the workforce. According to a study by Ready Nation, the lack of accessible child care already accounts for a loss of over $570 million in lost earnings, business productivity, and tax revenue for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. This is why I'm an advocate for the private sector to be involved in this process. We need to encourage more of our businesses here in Kentucky to start looking at offering some type of child care as a benefit to their employees, just as they would insurance or leave time. Simply put, our great commonwealth cannot afford to see child care access worsen because we cannot afford to lose more people from our workforce. Good morning, I'm Danny Carroll, the state senator from the second District of Kentucky, and uh, it's an honor to be uh, co-chair of the Early Childhood Education Task Force uh, that we initiated this summer, and uh, we've had several meetings to this point, and looking forward to that. I want to thank the Pritchard Committee for their partnership, and all of our partners, uh, as we move through this task force, and with the goal of creating a sustainable early childhood education system in this commonwealth. We have had problems for years. Uh, in addition to uh, being a state senator, the uh, non, uh, not for profit that I run, uh, we have an early childhood education center. So I live this every day and I've seen the struggles and I've lived the struggles every day. And again, even before COVID hit, struggles. Uh, we have a fairly large center. Uh, we have low overhead. Uh, our center finishes in the red every year. The model simply isn't sustainable from, from the view that I have with the type of services that we provide. As we move towards the future and looking at the, uh, the task force and what our priorities are, we have to consider that we've got to provide affordable child care in the Commonwealth for our families. 
we have to provide a, a living wage for our early childhood educators. We have to uh, think about workforce development uh, issues. Uh, that was really brought to light during COVID. Uh, the Senate or the House bill that my co-chair mentioned is I think will go a long way in that area and we kind of set a standard for the future on, on how we can partner with businesses to, uh, to make it work. And uh, we have to make sure that our providers can sustain their programs, whether that be a not-for-profit, whether it be a private business, whether it be an in-home uh, child care provider. Uh, we have to look at all these different levels and make sure in the public sector that we're also providing enough funding to make sure that those programs can sustain. We have to think about quality. Uh, and as we have that conversation, and uh, Senator Gibbons and I often speak about this, as I speak on quality, speaks about basic child care in many parts of the city. We simply don't have right now. So that's another component. How do we grow these centers in the state and how do we build quality as we grow these centers? Um, so those are, are lots of problems that we have and, and the task force has a daunting uh, responsibility ahead of it. I don't know that we can finish this interim. There are so many layers of this that we have to cover. Please understand that the legislature is acutely aware of the importance of this issue. Therefore, the task force was created to address that. But we want to make sure we do it right. We don't want to just throw money out and hope for good results. Uh, Dr. Van Over, some of the decisions that were made with the cabinet uh, kind of set a baseline for us to go by with the money that was infused into the system and the results of that. So I think we have something to start with. And we can look at what's happening in other states to, to look for a model that can work in the Commonwealth that can move us forward in so many different ways. One unique idea that goes along with the bill that we had, uh, we talked with, uh, nurse, or, uh, with nursing homes. The idea of nursing homes having child care facilities within their facility, what a great mix to have kids there to interact with our seniors. Uh, the, uh, the CNAs, the other staff there, having that ability to have child care on site. Those are the types of ideas that I think will get us through this. We've got to think outside the box. Uh, again, thank you to the Richard Committee for all the support and uh, look forward to working with all of you in the future and making changes and getting this Commonwealth in the right way. And next to share the findings of the report, uh, Benjamin East. Richard Committee, Mandy Simpson with Metro United Way, and Dr. Sarah Vanover with the Andy Hamilton. Before we get started, uh, if we could just have a round of applause for uh, Senator Carroll and Representative Heverin and the incredible work they're doing as co chairs of the EC Task Force, as well as our other elected representatives in the House tonight. Let's get a round of applause. For As uh, our president and CEO Bridget said, my name is Benjamin Geese with the Pritchard Committee. Um, we like to say that when it comes to Kentucky nonprofits, the teamwork makes the dream work. And so I'm so honored to be with Sarah Vanover, uh, Kentucky Youth Advocates, and Mandy Simpson with Metro United Way. Um, without whom this report would not have been possible. Um, just a quick overview before my colleagues get into the real meat and potatoes of the report here. Um, as Bridget said, uh, we were very successful uh, in getting a strong uh, response rate on this survey throughout the Commonwealth. You see here on this page, uh, the state outlined there, and unfortunately Duke Blue and not UK Blue, uh, we'll work on that later. Uh, you'll see we had over 94 counties respond to the survey, uh, which equated to over 500, roughly over 500 uh, child care providers throughout the state. So when you talk about quality of data, will this impact rural Kentucky? Will it impact urban Kentucky? Will it impact every Kentucky in between? The answer is most certainly yes, and this map shows that. Um, again, we also want to give our uh, many thanks to the Kentucky Division of Child Care who helped uh, get that incredibly high response rate. Uh, when we talk about good government, good government works hand in hand with state nonprofits to make a difference, kids and their families. So thank you to the Kentucky Division of Child Care as well. Um, with that, you have uh, the validity of the data secured, I hope. I'm going to turn it over first to, I believe, Mandy to walk us through the initial findings. Thank you, Ben. I'm going to kick off our deeper dive with a closer look at what is really the primary precipitating and perpetuating factor in Kentucky's child care crisis. And 
that is the dire workforce shortage in the sector. We know that labor shortages are affecting industries across the board, but these challenges are steeply compounded in child care. In child care, where the median annual income for a teacher is just north of $22,600, which cannot compete with hospitality and retail today. In child care, where providers are unable to provide access to health insurance, retirement benefits, sometimes even paid time off, as they are working to keep the cost of tuition low and affordable for the families that they serve. In child care, where educators do not have the same access to educational scholarships as others who are entering critical in-demand fields in our commonwealth. In child care, where the running joke is why did the early childhood educator cross the road? And the answer is to get to her second job. In child care, where far too often we are asking teachers who live in poverty to provide an opportunity that lifts other families out. These realities might lessen the shock of the data I'm going to share a little bit, but they certainly do not lessen the concern. So a fragile ecosystem finds that 58% of responding providers do not consider their programs fully staffed. So more than half of programs who responded know that they are not fully staffed. While this is solidly concerning on its own, it is also likely an underrepresentation of the actual staffing levels that we're seeing throughout our about 2,000 providers in the state, because many providers who did not respond likely do not have the capacity to do so, and they themselves are working in classrooms and serving multiple roles. As we dive deeper, we find that 75% of those providers who are understaffed need one to five more staff members, 17% need six to 10 more staff members, and 8% need between 11 and more than 50 more staff members. This is challenging for all working families in Kentucky who are in need of care. And this is how that translates. Without these vital staff, child care providers are forced to reduce enrollment, to close entire classrooms, to shorten hours, just to make sure that they can continue to operate in safe, healthy, and effective ways. A fragile ecosystem finds that if child care providers could recruit and retain the needed staff, those who are understaffed, 24% could serve 11 to 20 more children today. If they could snap their fingers and hire these staff today, they could start serving 11 to 20 more children. 21% could serve 20 to 50 more children if they could hire those staff today. 23% of providers who are understaffed could serve more than 50 additional children if they could hire the staff they need today. Our working families need every single one of these slots available. If we are ever to overcome Kentucky's severe child care supply shortages, we must at least unlock the capacity that exists within our currently operating programs by providing the critical supports our early childhood educators need. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Sterling. Thank you, Mandy. My name is Dr. Sarah Vanover, and I'm the Director of Policy and Research with Kentucky Youth Advocates. I'm also a mom of two young children in Fayette County. So along with reading the statistics on a page, I'm somebody who is affected daily by making sure that my young children have safe care so that I can go to work and help support my family, and so that I can have a career that, that I'm proud of and that I want to be a part of. When the Cabinet for Health and Family Services created the plan to distribute the American Rescue Plan dollars. They looked at long-term funding, they looked at one-time funding, capital um, ways to help create more child care programs, as well as subsidy and stabilization payments that went to make sure that child care programs throughout the state who had suffered during the pandemic did not close their doors. And so with all that money having a distinct timeline, stabilization that's ending in September 2023, and then the additional flexible funds that might be supporting child care subsidy or start of new programs, that funding ending in September 2024. Child care providers have to think about the future. In the survey, we had more than 50% of the centers say that their center would not have been able to stay open without the stabilization payments. And then an additional 40% said that their center benefited greatly from those payments but they might have still been able to stay open. Only just under 6% said that they 
minimally benefited from those funds. So the greatest part is we know that half the child care programs in the state, a thousand child care programs, would not have been able to keep their doors open without the stabilization payments. Now what were those payments used for? 82% of the centers and programs, family child care moms said that, that they used those funds, the stabilization funds, for wage increases. And as Mandy said, when your average income is just over $22,000, we have to find a way to increase those wages to attract wonderful teachers to the field and to help them stay there. Not only so that we have qualified teachers, but so that those teachers can support their own families. The centers that were unable to increase wages, a lot of that was fear of the future or that they had so many, so many problems that occurred during the pandemic that they were still trying to pay off past debt and they still had a desire to increase wages so that they could get the staffing that they need. Now we have to think about what happens when the stabilization payments run out. When providers no longer have access to those funds, what are the centers and family child care homes going to do? Almost 72% said that they're gonna to have to raise tuition. As a mom who's been paying tuition for the past nine years, <laughs> uh, well, the past 11 years now, it's a huge part of our family income. And many families are for, forced out of the workforce because the, the tuition is so high they can't sustain it. But now, funds tuition could increase. And how is that going to affect the workforce? Another 39% said that they're going to have to cut staff wages. Well, let's say that the center was able to increase wages to $12 an hour, which is still very small. But now they're going to have to reduce it, maybe closer back to minimum wage. Would you want to stay in that workforce in that, that particular job? Staff layoffs was another uh, issue that could be coming up. Programs closing and reducing the amount of available child care in the community and taking jobs away from the people who are trying to work. Only 13.98% said that they would have no changes when the stabilization payments ran out. So we have to think about 86% of our centers are going to have to make drastic changes when the stabilization payments are gone in September 2023. We have to start planning now to think about what we can do to support the centers and make sure that there is a constant stream of child care because child care is the industry that supports all other industries. And for concluding comments, Adrian Johnson, President and CEO of Metro United Way. Hi, good morning. Thank you sincerely to the Early Childhood Education Task Force co-chairs, Senator Carroll and Representative Heverin, for your leadership. Not only during this interim, but during years of dedicated service to Kentucky families and communities. And thank you to the Pritchard Committee and the deeply valued early childhood partners we stand with today. For more than 100 years, Metro United Way and Kentucky's United Way Network have been in our Commonwealth, improving lives and communities. We envision a commonwealth where everyone can access education that inspires and equips, economic mobility that meets needs and builds futures, and health that provides strength and hope. And we know that achieving that vision requires pairing powerful programming in our local communities with transformative policy making in Frankfurt. That's why I'm grateful to be here today illuminating a barrier holding back Kentucky families, employers, and communities, a lack of accessible, affordable, high-quality early childhood education. This is a child safety issue. It is a workforce issue. It is an equity issue, and it is a nonpartisan issue. Our youngest children need quality early learning environments for healthy development, our parents need childcare to work. Our businesses need employers to operate, employees to operate. And our state needs a strong early childhood ecosystem to prosper. These realities existed long before COVID, as, as did Kentucky's childcare crisis. But perhaps the steady pace of childcare program closures over time muted the collective impact. In 2020, however, the closing of doors rang throughout our community, 
And today, with the release of the Fragile Ecosystem Report, child care providers tell us it will become deafening without action. We can hear their voices now or endure the sounds of more programs shuttering, the shuffle of more feet leaving the workforce, and the frenzy of more families without options. At Metro United Way, we've deployed more than $5 million of PPE and temporary closure relief funds to child care programs in our region. We've successfully advocated for local planning and zoning reforms that provide greater access to child care. And we've worked closely with Representative Hedlund to advocate for House Bill 499, establishing the Child Care Assistance Partnership. But we must do more. We all must do more. We urge policymakers to act on the key recommendation we present alongside partners today in a fragile ecosystem for continue the vital investments and improvements that have thus far prevented the collapse of our child care sector and begin building the early childhood ecosystem where children, families, and employers can truly flourish. The Kentucky United Way Network and all of us here today stand at the ready to work by your sides. Thank you sincerely. Early childhood is, in fact, a fragile ecosystem in Kentucky. And as long as it remains a fragile ecosystem, Kentucky's families and Kentucky's economy face an uncertain future. At this point, I'd like to take questions um, from the press or um, from those here assembled and would ask that all of those who presented uh, be ready to respond to any questions um, given their expertise. So when specifically are we looking at the funding from the American Rescue Plan Act to kind of run out in this regard? So sometime before the end of the 2024 budget session. Um, depends on the use of those dollars, but definitely sometime before the 2024 budget session ends. Approximately how much money per year would be needed just to keep things at the status quo? Just to keep things at the status quo, Dr. Vanover. And then a follow-up question to that, would there be a dream figure that you would have to increase or improve? Well, I can tell you right now that the cabinet is working on some estimations to figure out how the changes that have been implemented, for, particularly for subsidy funds and um, startup funding for new family child care homes, those types of things, how that would look. Now, nationally, we have some numbers that we know you know, at the, at the national level. We were given $763 million through the, um, the American Rescue Plan when it came to Kentucky. 490 of that was the stabilization payments, and then the rest went to the supplemental funds, and that was discretionary. The cabinet designed some different programs. Most of it focused around um, child care subsidies, and it really opened the gates for child care subsidies with that money, because pr prior to that, um, it would be 165% of the federal poverty level in order to access subsidy. And let me tell you, as a middle class family, <laughs> when I had an infant and a toddler in child care at the same time, I paid $18,000 that year in child care. And as a middle class family, that was intense then. And then we think about our low income families, and, and it's, it's overwhelming. So the estimates are still a little bit fluid because we know that there are certain programs we want to continue. One is the protected population, CCAP. Um, program that the cabinet's getting ready to implement on October 24th, where child care providers can get child care <laughs> subsidies as long as they work in the child care program. Almost like they're getting a supplemented uh, benefit package because so many of our child care providers and community services so little benefits. We know that it's not going to be 763 million that, that we're looking for. That, that was a huge number and a lot of it was back payments, but we are looking at how to maintain the, the child care subsidy that's been put in place, and then how to subsidize some of those programs just so they can stay operational. Most of the child care block development grant funding that we get, it's focused, 70% of it is focused on low income families and subsidizing them. But again, that, that's not where, where everybody, you know, everybody didn't fit in that. Right now, if we think about 158,000 slots in child care in Kentucky, throughout the state. About 17% of those slots are for low-income families. So that means 83% of families are paying child care completely out of their pocket 
and it's probably their greatest living expense. Infant care, the average infant care in the state of Kentucky is approximately $11,000 per year, and that's more than our state tuition for UK, UK, you know, state schools, both regional and in large scale. So those are the things that we have to think about. Those numbers will be coming soon. The secretary has already announced at several meetings that they're trying to find a way to, to look at that. And then federal numbers are showing that, you know, if we're getting $2 billion a year right now, we need to at least triple that, possibly get it up to 10 to $12 billion in order to maintain some of the cushion that we've created <clears throat> during the pandemic in order to serve more families and to cover more costs. We can serve more families, but if we're only helping them with like a third of the cost, they still don't have the money for the remaining two thirds. So we need to cover more of the cost and we need to serve more families in order to make the system relevant for parents and to help with the fire systems. For the Pritchard Committee, as part of our big bold ask that we released a couple years ago, um, we're asking for a little over $330 million to support both public preschool and child care in pub greater public-private partnerships that ensure a rich early childhood ecosystem at the local level. $330 per year? $330 million, yes. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Per year. On okay. top of the base. Are there any outside of direct uh, subsidies or stabilization payments? Are there any policy changes that will help child care providers? So policy changes when um, mixed delivery or public-private partnerships are the policy changes that we believe are right for Kentucky to stabilize the ecosystem um, at the local level and statewide. Um, so that way families have access to the type of child care or early learning environments that best suit their needs as working families, a full working day, a full year-round schedule, um, while also availing themselves of high quality preschool services that get youngsters ready for them. You don't already have public private partnerships? We have some pockets. A number of years ago, the legislature actually carved out a, um, a grant pool for preschool partnerships at the local level. So there are some examples of partnerships, but as a statewide policy, that type of partnership does not exist as it does in some other states currently. So the task force will actually hear um, later this afternoon. Then. That is correct. In three p.m. today. You want to share a minute about that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, so, as Bridget said, uh, one of the policies that um, we are sharing this afternoon with the Early Childhood Education Task Force uh, is a public-private partnership, uh, more specifically known as mixed delivery preschool. Uh, mixed delivery preschool is best known as putting a, a public preschool uh, within. A private child care sector uh, center, pardon me. And so you ask yourself, well, what does that mean? It means a number of things. One, it allows for the blending and grading of funding to better serve the child care sector. Uh, in that setting, you could effectively blend, and model states have, and I'll share a bit about those model states, um, one being directly to our east, the state of West Virginia, doing quite well, uh, blending federal Head Start money, uh, child care subsidy, private uh, parent tuition, as well as public preschool dollars. Uh, to better expand access to public preschool and to further stabilize the child care sector. Um, when you think about, okay, financially, that makes sense. What does it mean for kids? Well, what it means for kids is that they get access to a strong curriculum that fits their, de uh, their developmental needs. Um, if we take a look at some of the most recent research, um, we know that a more rigid K-12 system, as we imagine K-12 in our mind's eye, is not necessarily the best for little ones, for threes and fours. Rather, we need to give them a type of environment that is more play-based in order to expand that natural childlike wonder and curiosity uh, that we love seeing in our small children. Uh, because there's been research, particularly out of Vanderbilt University, that shows when those littles, the three and the fours, are in that more rigid environment, it's not developmentally appropriate, and it actually does more damage to them long-term than it does good, uh, which leads to Mandy's call and Dr. Vanover's call and Bridget's call uh, for quality. The research also shows something, in this case, is not, in OT not, better than uh, nothing. Uh, quality is key when it comes to early childhood. So we think mixed delivery policy for public-private partnership doesn't make sense financially. The answer is yes. Does it stabilize the early learning sector? The answer is yes. Is it best for kids, developmentally and educationally? The answer is yes. 
here's the coup de grace and my closing point. Will it better serve working parents? The answer is yes, and here's why. Most of the uh, public preschools throughout the Commonwealth, and I say most, not all, so most, are only half day. I don't know about you, but my boss is behind me, and she's a great boss, and she probably would, but I'm just going to use this as an example. I don't yet have children, that's in the cards, I hope. Uh, but me having to leave at 12 noon to jet across town and pick up my son or daughter from preschool, that's not going to work for most Kentucky families. It's not going to work for most families at all. So imagine for that half day, your little one is in a high quality, developmentally appropriate, safe, fun preschool. And rather than having the public school system invest a ton of money to send buses all over the county halfway through the day, or you leave work, and to Representative Heverin's point, taking out money you could be making for your business, tax dollars you could be uh, making for the state, you gotta go pick up your kid. In this scenario, your kid is done with preschool, half day, and the only thing that little one has to do is walk in a little line across the hallway for the rest of the day. Imagine how that will increase access for those children throughout the state, having an immediate positive educational benefit, safety benefit, health benefit. Imagine what that's gonna do for working families across the state and the state economy overall. So when we talk mixed delivery, public-private partnership that really goes to strengthen cooperation and collaboration among all parts of the sector, Head Start, child care, public schools. Did I do a good job? And then they can hear more about this <laughs> later this yeah. afternoon at what time and which state will be joining me. Yes, uh, you doing. can hear more about that at 3 p.m. this afternoon in the Capitol Annex room 149. Um, it will be a meeting of the Kentucky Early Childhood Education Task Force, uh, which is co-chaired by Senator Carroll and Representative Cameron, who was with us earlier. And the state that's joining me. And the you. state that's joining me uh, is our sister state, West Virginia, uh, that does this to great effect. Uh, so if any members of the media, legislators, partners would like to join us today at 3 p.m., uh, you're more than welcome. Okay. And Dr. Vanover just uh, reminded me that Fayette County Public Schools will also be part of that testimony. Um, speaking to how they started to design a, a, a mixed delivery model. Other questions? Okay, thank you all for joining us.